Assalamu alaikum, Muhammad. Wa alaikum salam, Amin. How's it going? It's been a while. <laughs> it has been a while. How long has it been? A I month? don't know. Let's think. It was near Hajj time. Uh, it's been a while. Hajj was actually a month a month ago now. Oh no, it was a month ago that I left for Hajj. Um, yeah, it's probably been around. It feels like two months. Oh. 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 Maybe six weeks, maybe six weeks. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> what's the latest? What's new? I can um, see you, you've uh, updated your profile picture on Slack. Have I? Yeah. I or maybe it doesn't. This. Oh, maybe it grabs it from somewhere. Maybe. Let me see. What yeah. You got the. You look like something, someone from the Matrix or something. I'm so confused. <laughs> oh, yeah, I have. But I don't remember doing that myself. I think it's grabbed it from somewhere. Mm, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, what's anything new? Uh, oh, God, let's think. Let's think about it. Um, for... Uh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I'm, maybe I'm we'll through just... through my... Uh, social yeah. media to see if there was anything that could jog my memory but there isn't really anything okay okay um obviously for me there was something there are a few few new things uh one mm -hmm. of which we're going to discuss i suppose so i guess we'll jump straight into it go for it bro how has it been how was your adventure so i didn't mention it on a previous podcast but i was planning to go to hajj um last time we recorded I had already booked it, I believe, so uh, I knew at that time. And yeah, I went to Hajj. Uh, I left for Hajj early August. I came back mid-August. So Hajj itself is only like f five days-ish, yeah, around yeah. five days. Um, so we had all the other time, Medina, and just uh, doing Omran stuff. So, so in this episode, episode 44 of the Mind Heist podcast, we're going to just discuss Hajj. I guess you're going to ask me about what it was like. And I'll just try and, I don't know, add any insights, any observations I made while I was mm. there. I would say there's plenty to say. There's plenty to talk about. So we could kind of jump right in, man. What's the so, first question? So is this, what sort of experience is this for you? Is this the first experience you've been to Mecca? Or is it? Have you so been yeah, it's the first time I've been to Mecca. Yes. I've been really? to Saudi before, but not Mecca. Really? Yeah. So you never did Omrah beforehand? Like no, I didn't. Yeah. Is there a reason for that? or You know what, bro? Uh, I didn't uh, prioritize it. You know, that was one reason. The other reason, I think, you know, I, I actually started earning money a bit late, like late compared to the average. So I couldn't afford it before. Mm. And um, I, I guess, you know what it is, bro, to be quite honest, I never had this longing to go to Mecca, right? right. I, I know a lot of people like, yeah, I want to visit Mecca. I want to visit, you know, the house of Allah. I want to visit the city of the Prophet Sallallahu I never really had that feeling, okay? Hmm. And and therefore, and I obviously I know Umrah is a good act of worship. Maybe I never actually learnt the huge rewards of doing Umrah and stuff. Hmm. And so I was just kind of like, look, I'm not going to Umrah, right? Umrah is not obligation obligatory so let me just when the time is ready when the time's right i'll just do hajj because that is obligatory you know so yeah. i had a bit of a dry thinking of it so that's why yeah all right and um but also oh, you only did the obligation essentially you wanted to just is that financially though as well because i've always had it in my mind like if i'm already like saving up enough to get to umrah i might as well just not get the umrah and keep going exactly exactly that that was it I, I uh, f probably a year ago, I was thinking, you know what, I'm not going to be able to afford Hajj anytime soon, so let me just do Umrah, right, because it's much cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, but then, I don't know, just stuff got in the way, I never ended up doing it, and then I just ended up in the position where uh, it was obligatory for me to go Hajj, so I was like, look, let me go Hajj. Uh, it's, you know, the, I, was, I'm try I was trying to think in a very conservative way. So I'm thinking I could like I could delay Hajj maybe for one year, right? Yeah. I think some scholars say you know that's allowed, but I was thinking realistically based on what's coming up in my life and this and that, I'm not going to do it next year or 
just how I skip it this year, I'll skip it next year. Mm-hmm. So I thought, look, right now, I mean, technically, it's an obligation. Um, it's an obligation. It, it and it, it just felt like a good time to go as well. But the main reason was, look, it's obligatory. And the big, the big twi- twist that happened in my mind is I found out how much you can go for because you know, in in my mind, it was like eight thousand pounds to ten thousand pounds like that was like really? a normal minimum kind of thing i thought that's how much it was these days maybe because i did a little research before and that's what i found right. so when i when my friend told me that he was going for much less than that i thought oh well actually it is obligatory and actually it is doable for me yeah. so that kind of changed everything for me the problem was bro that when i found that out it was only i don't know two three months before hajj so i had to move very oh, quickly right, you know yeah. Allah. Well, I accept it from you. Um, oh, so I, I know I'm skipping a little bit ahead, but you need to explain to us what was your first sort of reaction when you saw the cab right in front of you. Like, mm. what was that? Yeah, like? you know, when I was going towards the Haram for the first time. So just to tell you a little more detail, we landed in Medina. Uh-huh. So I landed in Medina. So we were in Medina first for like four days, um, and so then we went to Mecca. So we, right. we could talk about Medina later, but so when we went to Mecca and we arrived just to set the scene. We arrived in Mecca at around 3 a.m. Uh-huh. Okay. For some reason, the bus journey from Medina to Mecca took like, I don't know, 11 hours, 10, like a long time. And even yeah. though a- actual driving, it should only take four hours. But anyway, that's, that's, that's life, right? So we arrived at 3 a.m. Very tired. Um, we got to our hotel. And Fajr was around in an hour's time, like four a.m. And yeah. remember, we're we're in Ihram now, yeah. We're we're, we're wearing the Ihram clothes. We're in Ihram because we we're going to with the intention to do Umrah, right? So when we pass the Miqat, you know, just outside Medina, when we passed it, we made the intention we're going to do Umrah. So we arrive, and you you know, you pretty soon you have to go and do the rest of your Umrah. You know, you have to do your yeah. Uh, tawaf around the Kaaba. You have to do your sa'i from from Safa to Marwa, etc., um, and cut your hair and all of that. So, so uh, a lot of people were thinking we're going to arrive, we're going to pray our fajr, and then we'll just sleep and we'll wake up and then we'll do do all of that stuff. Right. But I decided I wanted to do it then. So I slept maybe twenty minutes, thirty minutes, and then I got up and I went to the haram. So it's like fajr time, pretty much when we're going. And the thing was, bro, I didn't get a perfect experience of seeing the Kaaba the first time because it was it was the first time I'm going. I'm not that experienced with where I should go, like which right. floor, where will be busy, where won't be busy. So I ended up getting uh, to do my tawaf. I ended up going to the uh, roof level, okay, to do the uh, of the tawaf kind of place. I yeah? understand, yeah. And when you're on the roof... You can't see the Kaaba unless you go to the edge of the roof and look down. Right. So my first view of the Kaaba was like that, like just like little peering over the edge. And there was like a glass thing between me and the edge and stuff. Um, but it was special still. Wallah. It was special. It's yeah. the Kaaba is very big compared to like what I was imagining, you know. Really? Yeah, I think. When I when you see it from above, you know those like kind of helicopter kind of shots you see yeah. of, of the haram, it looks kind of tiny. I guess because you're looking uh, from the context of the whole building, like the cab is tiny compared to the whole building, like that huge yeah. building. But but when you're close, like in that area around it, it does really look quite big, and it's very black. It's like a very pure black in a way, um, and. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't say, you know me, man, I'm not that like, I'm not, unfortunately, to be honest, this is where I was lacking, is that I'm not one to have like uh, such emotional experiences, yeah. but I don't know, man, it was special still, it was good, that was the first time I, I saw it, but then I would say the first time I like proper felt it was when I got to the ground level, where I was standing and it's right in front of me, and you like, you're looking up at it because it's that big and yeah. you're, you know you're, when you're on the ground level so uh that was that was more special maybe that time that time when i saw it properly subhanallah what was your experience like with other people there generally i mean the, a lot of brothers went this year a lot mm. of brothers i know went and they were 
surprisingly everyone was in different groups i thought everybody might know each other but mm, yeah um, yeah uh there were you know some of them saying it was the hardest thing they've ever done in their lives some were saying that um well a lot of them said that it was the hardest thing they've ever done in their lives would you consider it the mm. hardest thing they that you did in your life <laughs> not at all man really <laughs> not at all um i can think of a few things i've done much harder and in general if i think of it it's not even gonna make like the top 10 hardest things i would say um mm. I didn't find it very hard, to be honest, alhamdulillah. The hardest thing was the fact that I got ill um, during the ah, whole the whole trip, right. which, you know, to be honest, I should expect because I'm very, uh, very easily I can get like a cold or a flu or whatever. So I was expecting that, you know, from the lack of sleep, I got I got ill. Um, that, that honestly, if I never got ill, bro, it would have it would have been like literally uh, what can I compare it to? Like literally similar difficulty to just like visiting Algeria and like not having your own house and like mm. staying in family's house and not having your own bedroom and like these little things well that's yeah. that's how I found it anyway I know the people that were with me in the group some of them found it much harder I know the ladies found it harder which I would completely understand that but so, I'll give you an example yeah go on uh we're going we're going Mecca to Medina, uh, Medina to Mecca in in a big coach, yeah. And halfway through, like let's say four hours into the journey, we stop at a station place. Uh, we stop at a station place, yeah. Yep. And it's time for Aisha, so we all get out and we go to the bathroom slash wudu area to to do wudu, uh, and then we're gonna go pray, right? Now we go to the bathroom. Uh, like some people, obviously, they're gonna go bathroom before doing wudu, everything, yeah. Bro, some people in my group, they're getting into the queue to go to the bathroom. Once they get into the actual bathroom building, they're looking around and they're just getting out the queue. And they're like, oh no, I can't handle this. It's too dirty. Oh, I was surprised, no. man. It was like, for me, oh, it was a normal bathroom. Like, like it was cleaner maybe than, like, well, it was like uh, probably the average a bathroom in Algeria, Morocco, whatever. Bro. Right. It was normal. Uh, and then in the UK, actually in the UK, there aren't really any public bathrooms, are there? Like, you just use restaurant bathrooms and stuff. The, there are like, some. No, no, yeah. there are quite a few. Yeah, but they're, they're quite they're, dirty, right? Yeah, generally, yeah. Yeah, so it was probably on par with a public bathroom in the UK, man. It was, honestly, it was not dirty. I cannot say it was dirty. I would say it was average. So, but some people, for example, just to give you that example, people found that part difficult, like, how do I do this? And some people find, you know, you're wearing the haram clothes and you're trying yeah. to use the bathroom. Some people found that hard. But I find it easier than wearing trousers, to be honest. So it's each person's, you know, thing, really. But I didn't, I can't say I found it difficult. Um, lacking sleep, yes. But you just kind of push yourself and you, you're kind of, you're there for a reason, you know. So you're more able to push yourself. It's mm -hmm. not like you're ill and you're waking up for work. <laughs> you know, yeah. that would be harder, is it, to push yourself? Because you don't have a bigger purpose. Um, did, did you find that, like, I think for a lot of people, obviously they save so much. And for you, especially, like, this was your first time. And, yeah. Allah alam, inshallah, you go again, but you might not be able to go again for a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you feel like there was a lot of pressure on you to get it all right? Yeah. Like everything correctly? Yeah, definitely. I did. I did. Um, and, alhamdulillah, part of, the, part of the, the good thing was going with a group saves you from some of that right if you go with right. a group where you, you could trust them they're kind of going to be telling you okay this is the way you do it this is the sunnah way this is the extra sunnah thing to do mm. and so uh, that was kind of taken care of for me a little bit by going with a group going with a group that you can trust you like imagine you go with a group and like you're half thinking oh these guys are dodgy <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> like yeah, how yeah. are you going to trust what they're, and then you're going to leave hajj maybe thinking Man, maybe I should try and do another one in case. <laughs> oh, no, so, so for me, uh, I, I felt kind of at ease that I was going with this group. And on top of that, when we kind of got there, I kind of realized, okay, they're not going to be spoon feeding me. So that was when, when I got there already, which was uh, probably not the best thing. I should have learned this before. But I didn't know before that I wasn't going to be spoon fed. So once I realized I wasn't going to be spoon fed, I just started t trying to learn all the fiqh of how you do it and this and that and i went with a few people like when we go to do tawaf or whatever i usually didn't go alone so right. so i had people who had been like a few times like some of the people with me they'd been hajj like five times 
so uh, they were like able to show me some of the you know some of the details and stuff of exactly how to do it like you know like jamarat you know when you're throwing the the, the pebbles at the yeah at the pillars um it's like if you read that it's one thing but then when you go and do it you might get a little bit confused like i've read it all i've kind of learned it all but then it's like okay how do i actually go about it yeah. and sometimes you need people to copy you know so that was that was good but i did feel pressure man like for example the whole hajj time is like five days the whole hajj journey is was like two weeks but then you have stuff like arafah which is one day and so there really i felt a lot of pressure because it's not even the whole day it's dhuhr until maghrib that's all you've got for mm. for like arafah making dua and and like the prophet ﷺ said about um arafah the day of arafah that uh, al-hajj arafah that hajj is arafah right so all like if you get arafah right inshallah your hajj will be right and so you can imagine like there's only a few hours to get arafah right Mm. Um, and it's not it's not like you can mess up Arafah like how can you mess it up you could sit down on the floor and do nothing and that's fine right but obviously you want to make dua consist, con- constantly for that whole time if possible so you know you, you try and push yourself because the, 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 like you said you might never go again yeah it might be your only opportunity how um, so in what sort of what was your method in finding which group to go with a uh, recommendation to be honest if yeah, if i didn't find uh, a group that had been recommended to me i, I would have been 50 50 about going you know because of what you said like because you just don't know yeah. you're spending all that money um you're gonna spend years saving up to go again you want to get it right you don't want to have any niggling thing in your head that oh did i do it right and so when i was because like i told you i was late looking for a place so a lot of the places that were getting recommended were full <clears throat> okay mm. so so some places had spaces for me but i didn't know anything about these people uh, you know i heard a few read a few reviews or whatever so they seemed to be good at least in their organization but i didn't know anything else right um and so with that kind of situation, I was 50-50 about even going. I thought, mm, maybe oh, I'll wait one more year and then be actually more organized and actually get a place with the best group to go with, right, that I can find. Like, I mm. actually spend a while researching who's the best to go with. But, alhamdulillah, probably two, three people all uh, had experiences with them or their family going to Hajj with this group. Uh, I went with Munteda Aid, uh, not Munteda, Munteda Travel. So they're like, uh, do you know, have you heard of Munteda? I think so. Munteda Al Islami. I think they, they started as a um, a mosque. They're still a mosque uh, in, where is it? Prior, is it Prior's Green? Some, Parsons Green. Okay. Uh, so it's like uh, South Westish, or West, I think people call that West London. So. Um, so yeah, they were recommended to me by like two, three people, four people, you know, oh, my parents went with them. Oh, I went with them. They're good. Mm. They're this, they're that. And, uh, so yeah, that was it, bro. That was enough for me uh, because the people who were telling me, uh, they went with them and they're saying that they were good. They were people I know well. Uh, and there was a lot of them saying my parents went. So if your parents went and they said it was good, uh, you know, parents, maybe they're older, they find it harder, but if they found it good, then that's a good, you know? Mm. Um, and then when I booked it with them, I, uh, there was like a kind of, kind of a workshop thing that they organized. So that was the first time I went to that masjid. It was the first time I met the actual people that I booked with. And that kind of put me at ease because they did seem quite organized and stuff. So that sounds like yeah. this episode is now sponsored. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, I, 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 as I, got like when, from when i got to the airport in london yeah i found issues like that were lacking i found things that were lacking but I, I, the thing is bro what do i have to compare to i only been had once right yeah exactly <laughs> so yeah, it's overall i would say yeah it's good I, they probably if i'm gonna assume they're probably better than average right yeah. um because they they've got people there that they're, they're focused on doing things in the correct way according to the sunnah so that's good. 
Um, they try to be organized, so that's mm-hmm. good. They are organized in quite a few ways, so that was good. The main way that I felt was lacking, it was the lack of uh, kind of reminders, talks, explanations of why are we even doing this, this and that. And I, I visited some other groups, like while we're in MINA, you know, all, when we're all in tents, yeah. everyone in the UK is quite close to each other. So I went to a few different uh, tents and I found that they, some of these groups, they have loads of talks. Like before you do Tawaf, you might have two talks just about that. Yeah. And then before you do Jamarat, you have one talk about how to do it. And then one talk about like the history of it and the spiritual aspects of it. And so that was what I, you know, felt I was lacking. But what made up for it maybe was the the companionship of the people that were, that were with us. So the organizers, but also the people that, that were coming, like other people like me. Very good, bro. Mm. Very good. I think that made up. This is what I said. Uh, to uh, p- people before that made like half of my the the good side of my experience came from for the the people that I went with you know the the pure company so uh, alhamdulillah and I, I I was just quote unquote lucky with that because I didn't know who was going but uh, that turned out to be some very good people alhamdulillah um, I feel I feel like um, yeah you went on your own ascent in a sense yes. like you didn't go with any family yeah yeah exactly yeah I think. For me, although my first time, I'd, I want to go with some family. Oh. I feel like I'd be so <laughs> distracted and concerned about trying to look after them through the whole process. Hundred percent, hundred percent. My my wife's going to hear this episode, and I'm going to still say it. I said it to my wife anyway. It's good, I think, uh, uh, to go alone, right? Even mm. if you're married, even if you have kids, it's good to go alone for your first time, because, mm. like you said, no doubt you get distracted because you can't just think oh my wife could sort herself out no it's but like it's built into you to be like worried and concerned about that right yeah exactly exactly so if you're if it's not an obligation on your wife you know maybe your wife doesn't work you know she's not doesn't have the financial ability to go Mm. then go alone you get your obligation done uh, get it done properly and then when you inshallah if Allah permits you go with your wife take your wife on her first time and then you could be more dedicated to helping her and serving her and, and facilitating exactly yeah. that's that's what I think after going you know when I chose to go alone I didn't actually really have the choice because uh, my wife was, wasn't really able to go anyway but uh, I went thinking yeah I guess it will be good alone you know because it's like a more of experience you know alone time seclusion all of that yeah yeah Uh, but then when i actually did go and i saw other people with me who were with their wives or sisters or whatever i found how they were struggling to get in the mode if you like yeah and then i thought then i thought yeah that probably makes sense you know so some people of course and he understand i I always wanted actually to go had with my wife and stuff but I don't know. Maybe it's a thing where go Umrah with your wife, you know. Uh, but just your first Hajj, maybe go alone. Allah alam. But I found that to be good. And other people who were with me, they're like, you know what? I think I realize now if I went alone, it would have been better. So some mm. people told me that. Mm. But yeah. Well, may Allah, may Allah allow us to go many times with all I sorts mean, of people and on our own. I mean, no. <laughs> one thing that I heard from. A friend of mine a few years ago, and then it came up again when I went Hajj was that Umrah. Some people consider Umrah to be obligatory as well, once in your lifetime. Oh, okay. So I, I kind of had that in my mind a few years ago as well when I was thinking about, uh, okay, why would I go Umrah? I'll just save up instead and go Hajj. Mm. That kind of was, come, you know, was in my mind. But of course, when we do Hajj, we do Hajj Tamatur. So most people do Hajj Tamatur, which includes Umrah with it. So we do both in one. So, inshallah, if it's an obligation, then that's done as well within the same thing. In in terms of like preparation and stuff, what did you yeah. did you read anything? Did you attend any courses, or what what sort of preparation did you get yeah. involved in? So, like I said, I booked very late. You know, most people book literally, man, like six months in advance. Um, Six and and some of I know some of the groups they allow you to pay you know in installments and this to make it easier for you and stuff. Right, yeah. Um, but I, 
I think I booked one month before I left or something like that. So the preparation I did was I attended the workshop of the Muntada's workshop, which was like, I would say it's a half day thing. It was probably right. like four or five hours. Um, they mo mostly helped, honestly, with what to pack and what to bring and what it's going to be like setting expectations. Okay. Um, they they gave a pretty good little book, which was uh, how to do Hajj and how to do Umrah, like all the steps. And that was very useful. I I brought that with me and I used it. Um, other preparation I did was I watched a series by Muhammad al-Sharif called Hajj Coach. If you just search on YouTube, Hajj Coach, it's like a series of short videos. And that was very good. Um, all different aspects, you know, like there's like 11 videos or something there. Uh -huh. And each video covers a different topic, different, you know, way of thinking. And in that series, there is a one pager of how to do Hajj and a one pager of how to do, uh, how to do Umrah. So that was useful as well. I printed that. I brought that with me. That was another thing I prepared with. Another thing I did was um, I wrote all my intentions for doing Hajj. Oh, that's good, yeah. So I wrote like, it was like one, two pages on why I'm doing Hajj, what I want to get out of Hajj, objectives for Hajj, basically. So I did that. And obviously these things are in deep in our mind somewhere, but when you write them, it becomes more of an intention. I think it becomes more real and some of you aim to do more material maybe. Mm. Um, I, I planned to write all my du'as uh, for Arafah before, but I, I didn't write too many. But in the end, I, I, I found the time during the trip to write all of my du'as. And uh, I heard, you know, it's not abnormal to have 10, 15 pages of du'a. Yeah. Um, because du'a on Arafah is accepted. Uh, it's a very special time to make du'a. And, uh, you know, people often, they ask you to make du'a for specific things for them. So you add that in and stuff. Um, so, uh, but then Hajj is full of du'a. Because when you're doing tawaf, what do you think people are doing when they're doing tawaf? A lot of people are like on FaceTime and stuff, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> but, but what you should be doing is either dhikr, making dua, reading Quran. These are all things to do while you're doing tawaf. And tawaf can take like an hour. It could, probably could take more than an hour, uh, maybe an hour and a half maximum. So that's some time to make dua. You might do many tawaf, you know. You might... Because, you know, you do tawaf for Umrah, you do tawaf for Hajj, you do two tawafs for Hajj, actually. And then you might just do extra tawaf. It's one of the best acts of worship you can do. And it's yeah. one of the acts of worship where you can only do in Mecca. So you want to take advantage of that. Um, we, You know, some people in my group were doing uh, one tawaf per day or maybe a couple per day, you know, just oh. while they're in uh, Mecca. Um, and where else do you do uh, du'a? You can do du'a. Um, where yes, when you're doing uh, sa'i, you know, when you walk between Safa and Marwa, mm -hmm. uh, when you reach uh, Safa and Marwa, when you reach each side, it's sunnah to make a long du'a there. When you do to go to do jamarat, after you know there are three pillars to throw stones on. Uh -huh. After each pillar, uh, sorry, after the first two pillars, it's sunnah to stop and make a long du'a there as well. Um, when you're traveling between Medina to Mecca. And between uh, Mecca and Mina and Arafah, these are all times to make du'a. So, the so I found so much time that we were making du'a while we, while we were on the trip, you know. So that was another, uh, you know, preparation. Part of the preparation of du'a is knowing that you, you're going to have a lot of time to make du'a. So get get ready. Um, other preparation was writing a wasiya. Wasiya is like a, it's a will, but it's not so much for your material possessions it's more like when i die do this and do this with my things and uh bury me in this place and bury me in this way and mm. i forgive these people and uh, i forgive these debts and you know all of that kind of stuff and is it, that is yeah. that specific to hajj or is that something that so this is just something i came across which was a tradition of people going to hajj because they didn't know if they would return uh, they didn't expect a lot some of them didn't expect they would return and so they used to write it before going. And I think that was a useful mindset to have that you might not return. Uh, some people do die in, in Hajj, uh, especially previously. There was stampedes and stuff like that. Hmm. So 
uh, you know, you want to have those things in check. And it's just like you try and making it, make it a turning point in your life, isn't it? Yeah. So it's something that you would... I always meant to write Wasiya, to be honest, but I never got around to it. So I thought, look, this is Hajj, baby. <laughs> this is time to do it. So I did that. Um, even to the... Honestly, I, what I found the most thing I'm like writing about is what to do with like stuff like my data and my flipping accounts all these email accounts and stuff um because you're not dealing with money because the money will be dealt with by the islamic way of distributing inheritance right but yeah. you can uh choose to donate like or give um i think up to a third of your wealth um outside of what the sharia dictates as long as yeah, yeah. So we, I don't think you need permission from the inheritors for that. Anything more than a third, you need their permission. Um, so you can stipulate, I want to give this much in charity. I want to build a well. I want to do mm. this, this, this. You can do that as well, which, you know, is a thing to do. Um, another thing is uh, people do with wasiya is like advice. Give advice to your wife. Give advice to your children. Give advice to your parents, to your siblings. Mm. That's what uh, some people do. I, I don't know why... I did do that actually. I think I did do it. I did it maybe just for my wife, maybe my siblings. I can't remember. Um, and so you kind of write that out and you keep it private. And then when you die, you know, maybe put it in an envelope. And then when you die, they can open it or something. Mm. Um, one thing I did, which I read somewhere and I liked it, is to ask to be buried in the the sheets that you did Hajj in. Oh right. Um, I like that because it's um it's similar and it's the same material you know and it's just like you know you meet Allah wearing those clothes which those clothes symbolize sacrifice for Allah and mm. going out of your way going across the world and paying the money and putting the time aside for Allah so that was another preparation is writing wasiya and then you've got all the things you need to buy and just be kind of ready um, I think that my group and the whole atmosphere, uh, I don't know what it's like in other countries, but all the, is a bit over the top for me, uh, being too careful. Oh, you've got to bring this, you've got to bring that. Oh, you'll, if you don't bring this, you'll regret it. Honestly, okay. I listened to them because I didn't want to mess up my hajj, obviously, once in a lifetime thing. But I found I didn't need like loads of it. So I felt it was a bit kind of wasteful, but alhamdulillah. One thing you need, I mean, I don't want to turn this into an advice thing for Hajj, but you do need comfortable shoes, you know, you do. <laughs> yeah. I could imagine. Um, but, Lots yeah. of walking, though. I think that's what people were saying to me that they found the hardest was all the walking. Mm. Yeah, uh, so the thing is, I was planning on walk walking a lot more than I actually walked. Um, the reason for that is, so basically, bro, all the walking you can do by bus like and that's what uh, i pretty much did yeah most of those journeys like from the haram to mina from mina to jamarat from mina to the haram people take buses for most of these things when you're mm -hmm. going arafa when you go arafa you you go bus so buses for everything to be honest the only time when i had to walk a lot obviously tawaf can can really hurt your feet the main blisters I got on my feet is from doing just tawaf. And that's because I was doing it barefoot. All right? Yeah. So, so um, tawaf is, I don't know, it's like a decent distance. But if you just tawaf alone, I don't think it would hurt your feet really. Right? Mm. Um, uh, the other time I did most of the walking, which we calculated we walked 15 kilometers in one day. That was the day of... Uh, they call it Yawm al-Nahr or is the day of Eid it's the day of Eid yes so it would be what would it be the 11th of the Hijjah I think anyway uh, that is the day when you need to get a lot of things done okay so you're, you're, you wake up in Muzdalifa you know when you sleep uh, in the open air you wake yeah. up there and that day you wake up at Fajr and that day you got a lot of things to do. So you walk from Muzdalifa to Mina, to your tents in Mina. That was like a one hour walk. Yeah. Then you must do, you must go to do your Jamarat, right? That's another like hour, maybe hour and a half walk there and back. 
uh, not there and back, there one hour and a bit and back one hour and a bit, yeah? So that's a bit more walking, yeah? Then yeah. if you decide, be, it's it's advised and it's the sunnah to go and do your tawaf and your sa'i in the haram on the same day, then this, this is the thing, the reality of that day is it's so busy that you won't get a bus to go there. And so All you're right. pretty much going to have to walk. So that's where the majority of our walking was. We walked most of the distance from Mina to the Haram, and mm. then, uh, and we arrived at the Haram at like Maghrib, okay? Which you're supposed to finish everything by Maghrib, but you know, Qadr Allah, we weren't able to, yeah? So we finished uh, our Tawaf, our Sa'i. It took a while because very busy that day, and a lot of people trying to follow the Sunnah. And we, we left the Haram at midnight, but we didn't arrive back in Mina uh, until like 4 a.m. Because we had to walk the whole way back, we got a little bit lost, and these kind of things. Yani, taxis are not really allowed. There are taxis, but they're not really allowed that deep into Mina, so yeah. they won't really help you get get really there. Really, like we took a taxi, and it sa- it shaved like twenty minutes off the time. To be honest, um, and I, and he couldn't really get much closer. So, uh, so that was the walking. That was the day we walked like fifteen kilometers. Yes. Yeah, honestly, that was. I, I don't I, like the the next day. I had already like recovered and felt like, oh yeah, that wasn't too bad. So yeah. it's, it's that kind of thing. While you're doing it, of course, it feels bad. But um, you know, you know, I, I know some people I was walking with, they were they got crazy blisters that day and stuff. Um, but yeah, that it was only one day. You know, the rest of the time you're not walking too too much really. Mm. So. Um. Yeah. If you could do anything differently, what would you do? If there hmm. was anything. I might have gone with another another group. Oh, no, <laughs> oh, no, no. It, it's not because it was bad. Honestly, I already said this, yeah. They're not bad. They're good. They're organized. I just I just saw how it could be better because I saw, I visited a few other groups. Right. So, and I saw those groups and the groups were like a tiny bit more expensive. So basically, I visited uh, Amana Tours. Amana Tours, they had like Sheikh Haytham with them. They had Sheikh Ali Hamouda with them. They had Sheikh Faraz with them. And it's very focused on like a bird and like pushing you basically, like pushing you mm. to get the most out of it. That was the main thing that I would have liked to get that I didn't get. The rest, right. honestly, was fine. It was good. So maybe I would have gone with them. Um, maybe uh, I'm not. I can't complain though. Like I said, yeah. Um, what else would I have done differently? You know, probably would have booked it earlier and stuff, and decided earlier, so I would have had more time to prepare. Mm. Um, what else? Uh, hmm. Is it, maybe it's a good thing. I can't think of some <laughs> things I would have done differently. Um, you know, I wanted to do one thing, bro. I think you would have liked to, you would this something maybe you would do is obviously you're in the haram or you're in the haram uh, the madani yeah and there are people from all over the world there are Muslims from all over the world so I wanted to go and take photos with people from every country I could find <laughs> that would have been <laughs> really good but yeah. I, I'm I'm too shy for that so I never ended up doing that so maybe I regret that slightly um, <laughs> subhanallah yeah what's maybe um, I, did you a so, little, yeah i was gonna say like so you spent did you spend any like substantial amount of time sort of outside of mecca and medina if you know what i mean like outside of the haram and medina like what's what's saudi like as a country sort of thing okay this was interesting yeah because i always had the idea that saudi is similar to uae right um, okay it's in the gulf it's got all or you know oil revenues this and that um, you know, a lot of people go and live there from the West. Well, not a lot, but some decent amount of people go live there from the West. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we'll get all these teaching jobs, blah, blah, blah. People live there. People enjoy it. Uh, you know, restaurants, this and that. Yeah. So that's what I had in my mind. But when I arrived, it was very different to that what I had in my mind. So oh, really? when I, like literally a few hours after arriving in Medina, I realized okay, this is just an Arab country, like a normal Arab country. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's not, 
is not like UAE whatsoever. It's more similar to like Algeria, Egypt than it is to UAE, I would say. Really? Yeah, like uh, the, it's very, very Arab, Arabic speaking compared to UAE. Um, right. Every like you need to know Arabic, you know, and me knowing Arabic helped a lot while I was there. I've got to say that that was something I noticed. Yeah. Um, for whatever it is, a, a lot of the time I, I you speak to the guards, like the guards in the Haram or the guards in in Medina, and they'll tell you like ways, quick ways to get around, or how do I do this? And they're very helpful. But if you obviously if you don't know Arabic, how can you actually ask them questions? Mm. Um, uh, yeah. So so Arabic is like everywhere, like. You really need to know Arabic. A lot of the non-Arabs there, they even they speak Arabic. Like some of the Pakistanis, they speak amazing Arabic, perfect Arabic. They grow yeah. up there. You know, a lot of a lot of them grew up there. Um, a lot of the kind of uh, jobs that it, it, Indians might have in the UAE, they had Egyptians in Saudi doing those jobs. So there are a lot of Egyptians, and obviously Egyptians they only speak Arabic. I don't think mm. they would even. They don't literally, bro. They don't even feel the need to learn English. I don't think these these Egyptians or whatever. Um, and yeah, it was quite very disorganized compared to the UAE. Um, just typical <coughs> Arab country, though. Very nice. So I, I pre preferred it in many ways because I felt like there was a bit more of a togetherness, like a bit mm. more of a community. Maybe that's because of the language. Um, maybe it's because maybe it's because the foreigners in Saudi, they, they a lot of them are speaking Arabic, and a lot of them are Arab. Maybe there's more higher proportion of Arabs, whereas in UAE it's like Arabs and Westerners and yeah. like Russians and Filipinos. But yeah, it, I feel there's maybe more cohesiveness in Saudi. Um, yeah, obviously religious, re, rigid, religious wise, religious wise maybe. If I obviously if I subtract the fact that I was in flipping Mecca and Medina, yeah. then I, I would say maybe it was similar to UAE. Maybe there are more, maybe obviously more religious people in Saudi in general, but um, the ability and the ease of doing a bed and stuff is uh, similar to UAE. Maybe you know, masjid everywhere. Um, I think a lot of the things that made it better religious wise was because it was hajj season and because it was in mecca and medina yeah, yeah but having yeah. said that you can live in medina you know and then you maybe permanently be in that kind of uh environment so yeah it was nice uh, that it was less more more open than uae as well like I don't know, like, obviously these people are approved and stuff, they're vetted, but in uh, Masjid al-Nabawi you find, you know, people giving lectures uh, in Urdu, in Arabic, in different parts of the Masjid, you know, people gather around, they listen. Um, yeah, so that was a surprise for me, actually. I thought it was, I didn't think it was, it was in the end, it's what I call a normal Arab country in terms of the organization, in terms of the society and you know all these things is just what i would i would expect from an arab country you know i feel like a, a lot of people not complain but a lot of people talk about the food there like it's all fast food <laughs> is that true or is it is there anything that you know you can decently mm. eat hmm interesting yeah i when i wasn't eating in the hotel i was eating fast food that's true yeah um but the reason that was kind of out of choice because I'm in the Haram and I'm getting hungry. And the obvious place to go is that mall next to the Haram. Right. And the, the mall has pretty much all fast food. So mm. that was why. Um, in Medina, I just purely, I did, yeah, I was eating like just breakfast and dinner. I wasn't, I just, I don't know, I just kind of skipped lunch. And I was just eating in the hotel. So, so the food in the hotel was fine. Like it wasn't unhealthy. I would say you can pick what you want, isn't it? You could pick mm. healthy or unhealthy. I was keeping it light, you know, just a bit of protein and a bit of salad kind of thing a lot of the time, bro. For the first time in my life, I can't imagine this. Yeah, can you imagine? I'm coming down in the hotel in Medina. It's breakfast, and obviously the hotel they're trying to sell, sell the perks of staying with them or whatever. Like yeah, right. buffet. Breakfast buffet, dinner buffet, yeah, buffet, loads of food, blah, 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 yeah. How can I come down and I go, and in our hotel, loads of Egyptians, yeah? yeah. Of course, I expect from Egyptians, they're going to pack their plate. Yes, they pack their plate. So be it, yeah? 
But bro, who eats jelly for breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> jelly bro. for breakfast? I can't get it through my head. You need that sugar rush, don't you? <laughs> right. So I saw some peculiar things people are eating. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I think. Let me think. I think if you, you know what? Now that I think about it, in the mall, like the mall near the the Haram in Mecca, like. There was like grilled food, so that's not really unhealthy, mm. um, you know. So, yeah, uh, I don't know. I didn't. I did not venture out too much. I didn't venture away from the Haram really. I yeah, know some people. Yeah. Some people that were in our group, they went to Jeddah to see family, maybe, uh, oh, okay. or they wanted to buy gifts, so they went to Jeddah. Maybe more shopping opportunities there. Um, and some people, I don't know if they did in the end, but they wanted to visit like the cave. What's it called? The cave where the revelation was revealed. The cave of Hira. Was it Hira though? Yeah. I thought yeah. it was. Anyway, yeah, Hira. Ghar, Ghar Hira. And there's another cave as well, I think, uh, linked to the Sira. Um, I think people wanted to go there maybe. There was an interesting there was an exhibition about the sahaba which was right next to the haram but i, I, I plan to go i never ended up going actually mm. um and there was what else is there there's one place in mecca that i'm just trying to remember i don't know there's obviously there's the battlefields like uhud and stuff we visited uhud that's in medina or just outside medina um it was cool it was good um but yeah, we didn't venture too much out. I was like, look, I'm here for limited time. I'm just, I would much rather do an extra tawaf than visit the cave. Yeah. If I had more time, like if some people were there for three weeks, in that case, yeah, maybe I would have done that stuff. And maybe that's the kind of stuff I would do if I'm there with family and with my wife, you know? Yeah. But yeah, me, yeah. I was like, I was trying to stay in the zone of just like, a bad uh, and just you know what I mean like yeah also I was trying to do I suppose there would you know no doubt be a lot of genezas there going on was that something that you partook in quite often like oh Genesa yeah prayers? yeah for sure yeah good that you ask that because after every salah pretty much there's geneza every yeah. fard salah there's geneza whether you're in Medina or Mecca yeah mm. but um crazy crazy story was one day in Medina after Asr we, we just prayed geneza and I just decided, okay, now I feel like going to Baqir, you know, the graveyard uh -huh. is just outside Masjid al Nabawi, where, you know, a lot of Sahaba are buried and stuff. So I just, I went to the graveyard there. Uh, I heard that, oh, it opens after Asr and Isha or whatever to visit or whatever. So I just went, I walked up there and I was walking around and it's very simple. Uh, you could probably Google it. Um, like the gravestones it's just sand and then just gravestones kind of thing right. the little gravestone um, so I'm there I'm just looking around I'm reading some of the signs they have explaining things and then I notice that they're bringing the bodies that we just prayed over they're bringing to bury them and I assume that Baqiyah is full and they don't bury people in Baqiyah anymore mm. but then I was like oh they're going to bury people so then I'm just watching I'm like okay interesting yeah then it clicks in my head you know, the reward of carrying the body and the reward of, of burying and all of that. So I'm like, yo, I'm in Medina, I'm in Baqir, and they're, they're going to bury these people. So so I rushed over there and Alhamdulillah, we actually got to, you know, take part in burying uh, one of these people, you know. Um, yeah. You know, somebody, uh, I wasn't there when they were digging it out, but they put the body in and then they cover the body with uh, some bricks uh, so we handed the bricks, we helped hand the bricks. And then after that, you know, we, we all, they were actually very, it's very nice because everyone knows the reward and no one's hogging it. So people are uh, passing the spade around because if you, there's a hadith about if you uh, put three handfuls of dust over the grave, the over the body, there's a very big reward, which I don't remember now. And so, yeah, people are handing uh, the spade around. You know, like one guy does three, and then he passes to another, oh, do three. Yeah. So it's very nice, very nice. Uh, so that was a great opportunity. Uh, I I was I did that with one guy. Uh, I just happened to be someone from my group, and afterwards he just couldn't stop crying. He's like, I can't believe we, we, uh, you know, we were, yeah, and he given this opportunity by Allah because it was just coincidence, really. Mm. 
um, and many of those things kind of happen. That this is this is what I wanted to say actually, bro, about the whole Hajj experience and the whole Hajj thing is is that I felt before I was when I booked my ticket and I was like, wow, am I really going? And then when I was on my way there, and then when I was there, it's just gratitude, just overwhelming gratitude to think that so few people are able to do this and mm. yet Allah has allowed me to go and not only has Allah allowed me to go he's allowed me to go with a, a good group good organization uh, everything set up for me in a way uh, young age you know very able to do all the walking and all of that and exactly, to just yeah. deal with being ill and deal with um, uh, you know not sleeping well for days on end like I'm able to deal with all of that and uh, and for the haram to be just so clean and so you can get around even though there's millions of people there it all is working so smoothly and it's just so much gratitude well it's it's overwhelming bro because it's like what did i do to deserve this and if i don't yet deserve it what do i do now to deserve it yeah uh, it's mm. it's really crazy man i don't like i, I can't I'm honestly, I'm not being uh, humble. I I can't think of how, what would make me among the like three percent or whatever percent of Muslims who are able to go there. It's it's too much. But th but then again, when I think of what would make me deserve that, then I just remember, it's not about deserving it. It's about Allah's mercy. Allah's mercy is just wider than that. Allah's mercy is wider than needing to even have a reason to let you go. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, and uh, it's it's hard. I mean, do you feel like I'm sure you're on a, quite a high iman wise, but do you feel like you've still got that? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how long yeah. it's been now, but like, is it is it something that's still carried with you, or can you already feel it waning? Well, yeah, I feel I, I I'm not. I can't say I'm. <laughs> I can't say I'm on that iman high anymore. I can't say yeah. that's true. Is it? It left very quickly, right? Mm. But one thing I kind of thought of, because I was obviously I don't want it, I didn't want it to go, but on the other hand, I'm thinking, yes, it is going to go. That's the nature of things. Uh, but one thing I realized is a very big reason for that Iman high was being with good company. Honestly, right. yeah. it wasn't just being on Hajj, being in you know sacred place. It was the people I'm with, the people who, um, literally, I, I want to go into details because this is the kind of thing we should try to you know do amongst friends and be among people like this where it's like you're just chit chatting between people and then someone mentions an ayah or you know like people are just mentioning Allah all the time people are mentioning ayat of the Quran you're mm -hmm. with Hafad of the Quran so you mention something and they'll just mention an ayah which relates to it and it just you know just to be in that kind of company um, younger people older people People who, uh, people from different countries, different, you know what I mean? It's just, uh, just company. Company is a big, big factor. And I felt like that outside of Hajj before. I have felt like that. And it was, again, it was because of company. Mm -hmm. So that's something I kind of realized. And then I just thought, look, inshallah, I, I went, I did Hajj. I did, I got, inshallah, it's accepted. You know, I have a good opinion of Allah that he'll accept it from me. And so now, inshallah, I've, I've got that reward. Inshallah, as the Prophet ﷺ said, I return like, I return from Hajj like the day my mother gave birth to me, you know, without mm -hmm. sins. Um, inshallah, the du'as that I made, because I tried to make du'as that would lay the path forward for me in life, you know, for yeah. when I come back. So inshallah, those du'as are accepted. And now that, all that stuff, it's in the past now. Now it's like, okay, the du'as, hopefully, you know, Allah will accept them and help me go forward. But now I'm hajji, quote unquote. Now I've got to yeah. act like hajji. How can I up my standards? How can I? And so my focus when I got back was always about habits. And, you know, I always try and build good habits. But how can I raise my standards with those habits now? Mm. So that's what I tried to do. Not to replicate the iman, the iman uh, that you get when you're there, the feeling, but to have some taste of it every day, mm. rather than 
an intense rush of it once a lifetime try and also have a taste of it every day that's what i'm trying to do you know oh my man i accept it from you bro i mean and allow us all to go i mean i mean i mean i mean if you you know what it is bro before i went hajj i was thinking that you know hajj you're not really obligated to save up for it you if you have if you end up with the money now you're obligated to go but i don't think you're obligated to save up for it so um i i'm half half between recommending that people put money aside every month and i'm half half like no maybe that money would be better going towards your family or whatever schooling maybe um charity i don't right. know really I, I maybe i'm not really able to advise on that but Nonetheless, if you do choose to save up for it, then no doubt it's worth it. And the more I, I said this to someone uh, and they kind of what's the word? They flinched or they like they didn't really seem to like the idea. But they were telling me, oh, I paid so much for this hajj and I expect it to be like this and this and this. And then I said to them, well, if it doesn't hurt to the amount that you're paying, if it doesn't hurt, if it doesn't feel like a sacrifice, then maybe that's not really Hajj, you know, because mm. in the past people would suffer physically and they would also suffer financially. They would sacrifice, not suffer, but sacrifice financially and physically. Now mm. we, we, it's much easier for us physically. So financially, let it pinch, let you know, feel a bit of that sacrifice. Come on. I mean, the whole Hajj is about sacrifice, about Ibrahim sacrificing, leaving his wife and his son. And sacri- being willing to sacrifice his son Ismail, and this is what we're doing in Hajj. You know, it's related to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Um, and so, you know, replicate that. Try and you know, have the mindset, have the attitude of sacrifice. Mm. Um, so that I, I don't know if if you had a ton of money and you went on Hajj, I don't know if you would appreciate it as much and you would work as hard for it. You know, so. You know, part of me feels like this is what Hajj is supposed to be like. You're supposed to, whether it's financially, physically, whatever, you're supposed to feel sacrifice, that you have to sacrifice, you know. And uh, it just reminds me as well of a feeling I got when I was in Medina, when I was in Mecca, is I was always thinking about the Prophet and how, you know, he he left Mecca and he went back and he, he conquered Mecca, he took back Mecca. And the sacrifices he went through in the Sahaba, and that was something that always that made it quite uh you know a spiritual exercise as well because i was just thinking about the prophet sallam you know visited the prophet sallam's grave and you're just thinking you know this is where the prophet sallam gave the khutbah this is where you know his house was and yeah. it's like is really there you're you're really there and you know one i remember one day we were praying isha in the haram in mecca and and the 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 uh, imam he was reading from surat uh, Surat uh, Fatih, yes, Surat Fatih, mm-hmm. um, and the the f- towards the end of it, where it's actually not just just towards the end of it, but the whole uh, surah is about how they you know they couldn't do Hajj that time, and then Allah promises them that they will go and do Hajj, and they will, uh, you know, Allah says, uh, uh, "Is it Amin Ra'usihim?" They will be mm. safe. They're, so this year they weren't able to go because they weren't safe. The, the Quraysh wouldn't let them go, but Allah said, Allah promised them that they will go and they will be safe and they will be shaving their heads, meaning they will complete the Hajj. And oh. so uh, that kind of that I don't know that was special for me because he's reciting and then I'm right there, the Kaaba's right in front of me, and I'm thinking, wow, the Sahaba really work for this. They work to re-establish Mecca as you know our qibla and our place that we can go and do hajj so oh. that was very special as well man oh, no, no. And it all, all comes full circle i suppose because yeah. you you hear about those ayat all the time and yes i suppose um you don't feel you don't always feel the affinity and the link to the sahaba or who, to who the quran was sent down to yeah in those ayat but then actually when you're there yourself you become mm. part of that ummah mm. quite vividly yes yeah and you know something very touching as well was um you know, many people, they go to visit the grave of the Prophet ﷺ. And I, when I was going, I wasn't sure if that's like a legit thing to do or not. So I looked it up and I found 
on Islam QA, which you know I generally trust Islam QA, he said the the etiquettes of visiting the the pro, the, the mosque of the Prophet mm -hmm. and one of them he said was to go to the grave, and you say he gave a specific thing to say, and it was very touching. It was like it was the what do they call it? The Tahiya Ibrahimiya. You know, like you say in Salah. Uh, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ima kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala Ibrahim. All oh, of yeah. that. Yeah, you say that. But then you say, and you say it as though you're speaking to the Prophet ﷺ because you're right there in front of yes, him. Yes. Yeah, and you say, right. you say, I bear, I bear witness that you are the true messenger of Allah. And that you did, uh, you did send the message. You did uh, convey the message, and and uh, it's it's a whole thing, right? But just the fact that you're saying it to the Prophet Sallam, that I bear witness you're the messenger, and I bear witness that you um, conveyed the message. You did convey the message, and basically you're saying I received the message, and that's why I'm here in the first place. Yeah. You know? And so it's because you know the last khutbah of the Prophet Sallam, when when he he gave the final khutbah, and at the end he said. Allahumma inni ballaghd fashhad. Uh, oh Allah, I conveyed the message, so bear witness. And he told all the Sahaba, he said, bear witness that I, I conveyed the message. And so now you're kind of going to him and you're saying that I bear, uh, I bear witness that you did convey the message. So that was, that was very special as well. Um, you know what, <laughs> it's been an hour already. I feel like uh, I kind of just touched the surface of Allah. <laughs> Fine, but, bro. Uh, there's a lot to say, and I've I've enjoyed it, bro. Mm, this is the thing; these, uh, inshallah, these lessons that you've learned will mm. continue with you forever. It shouldn't just be one episode; it should be something that you can always reflect back on and yes. uh, pick up pointers and stuff. And that yes. way, we can keep it fresh and maximize your benefit from it. Yes, yes, and that's that's what I was thinking. Like, uh, even my friend went to another new country recently. Uh, he's going to be living there, and I said. You know, you should re you should make videos of yourself talking about what you've observed there, even if you don't put it online. Like it, it might be something you reflect back on and you watch later. You know, um, so this podcast maybe it is public, but it's something that maybe in a few years I'll listen to this episode and I re remember what Hajj was like and stuff. Yeah, that'd be brilliant, actually. Because then it will, if yeah, if you find hard times and you can't go again, then this is the next best thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The memory. May Allah accept from from everyone that went to Hajj. May Allah allow us to go again, and again, many times. Whether it's Umrah, whether it's Hajj, allow us to visit His house and have it accepted from us. Uh, yeah, I mean, Ya Rab. Yeah, I mean, right. I think we'll um, we'll end it there for this week. Yeah, bro. Can I, I just say, say, bro? Go on. In in Mecca, you know who is representing one of the 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 people representing the most? Can you guess? Probably Algerians, huh? Yeah, no doubt about it. Bro. <laughs> I knew it bro. You know, mashallah, lots of Algerians, lots of Algerians, compared to like the like Algerian population is like forty million, which is not huge, but a lot yeah. of Algerians, mashallah, going to Hajj. Subhanallah, Subhanallah. See, good people, bro. Good people. <laughs> I saw one Tunisian. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we're hard times, bro. Small country, you know. Yeah, got... <laughs> it's true. It's true. But quite a few Moroccans, so alhamdulillah. <laughs> God. <laughs> what a joke. <laughs> oh, well, bro. Okay, bro. We'll call it a night then. Call it a night. It's only 2.20. 2.40. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, subhanAllah. <sighs> Inshallah, we'll keep them consistent, in the la. And yes. Uh, what, what, what do we need to plug? I forgot what we're supposed to plug, man. Uh, was it uh, uh, Curious Cat oh yeah god yeah something like that it should be in the descriptions um, and also we've got, we've got Mine Heist Twitter Mine Heist Instagram um, I'm taking on board what you said by the way about I've already said that to you privately but I say it publicly about sort of narrowing down what we're focusing on because mm. mm. um, I if anything has changed when you were away I was just doing loads of different things trying to find my niche mm. uh, I met a few different people uh, and they all had ideas what I should do right That's, but you can't do all of them <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean you can't do everything um, yeah. so yeah trying to hone in on some specifics which means mm. certain mm. things may be going away soon uh, oh, but no. I'll, I'll do that when I do that Inshallah. <laughs> Inshallah. One thing, quick thing on that, bro, is 
I, I remember a very good article I read, and it was ba- the basic basic uh, yani message was, uh, think of your life in seven year windows. So, like, if you did a podcast for seven years, even if you ended it after seven years, like, seven years is a long time. It's like a not too long, but it's enough time to really get good at something and yeah. really uh, contribute in a certain way. And, um, uh, but it's not so long that you're going to kind of spend huge chunks of your life on it, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Inshallah khair, bro. Okay. Cool journey, bro. Let's See you next time, inshallah. An evening. That was episode 44 of the long-awaited Mind Heist podcast. <laughs> <laughs> See you next time, inshallah. See you next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.